I hope you have had a very nice lunch and that it will not be your last, but we never know. So I do hope that you enjoyed every mouthful and also the shared meal. I think it's really beautiful that Bristol Institute is still doing the shared meals. A lot of the groups I teach at don't do the sharing anymore, which is a bit of a shame, but I think that's a, just a really lovely thing to participate in. So, yeah, thanks for everybody for making the opportunity. I also had some strawberries. I didn't show up for the full thing, but I had some, uh, some of the offerings. So thank you. Good. So uh, in this session, I would like to reflect a little bit on how we can actually support others in their dying process. And um, I must say that I haven't had the opportunity to do this much yet. Um, I'm certainly not a end of life, um, what do you call them? Doula. Doula. Doula, yeah. I did meet an end of life doula. And she even came to our monastery. She had like a, a little flask. I was saying this morning I have a thing for flasks. Well, her flask had skulls and flowers on it. Mm -hmm. And she contemplated death all the time. And I must say, she was a very joyful and um, humble person to be around. So, yeah, she was in that business. And mm -hmm. another of my friends in Oxford is um, training to be a Buddhist chaplain. So she's also going to be working closely with those who are dying. And in both cases, actually, they were meditators. They were people who had obviously contemplated quite a lot and who continued to contemplate their own nature. And perhaps that's why they can be very effective helpers in that situation. Because it is important, first of all, that we do our own emotional work. Um, the Buddha said also, as part of the First Noble Truth, that one of the causes of suffering is being separated from those that we love. Being associated with those we don't like very much and who irritate us, but also being separated from those we love. And uh, this is something we have to face, right? And how do we actually do this? So one of the things I sometimes contemplate when I'm thinking about my own life and the people who I know that I'm attached to and that I will you know, miss a lot when they go, is to recognize that much of my own uh, feeling around that is about myself. It's not about the other person. In the case of my teacher, he's, I think, very happy to leave his body whenever the time comes. You know, he's not attached to his body. Um, he has so much inner peace, and he's certainly not identified with his body. So it'll be very easy and probably quite blissful for him to die. And I notice when that kind of causes me to tremble a little bit that I'm thinking about myself. I'm thinking about how I'll miss that person. You know, many of you might be um, in relationships and often in the, the songs that we um, absorb in our lives in this Western culture, they're all about, I can't live without you, baby. <laughs> you know, and this is supposed to be like a big declaration of love, but really it's a kind of attachment and a clinging that does nothing to free our own hearts, but nor does it help the other to let go when it comes to their time to die. So sometimes we're more worried about ourselves, and instead of that, perhaps we can change our mindset and instead consider another person's um, dying process as an opportunity to serve you know, an opportunity to really hold space for that person and to listen. Sometimes they might not be able to speak, but we can listen inwardly to their emotional needs and essentially give them permission to die. This is um, something that my own teacher talks about a lot, and there's a story in Perth of a, a young man who was, I think, some kind of white water rafter and he had like a sporting business, very, very fit and energetic. And at the age of 30 or so, he got a terminal cancer and he had a wife and two young children. And uh, he was in the hospital bed for a long period of time and the doctors were wondering why and how he could still be holding on because his body was so emaciated. You know, he was really worn out. He couldn't really speak anymore. And his wife was by his side the whole time you know, giving him love, giving him assurance. But then, uh, I'm not sure if it was Ajahn Brahm himself that went to see him, but he said to um, this person's wife, 
Have you given your husband permission to die? And immediately she kind of got the point and she realised that he was hanging on for her. So she jumped up on his bed and hugged his emaciated body and just said, I give you permission, you know, please let go, let go. It's okay. And at that point, I think the next day, he passed away peacefully. So he was just holding on, you know, because he was worried about how she would cope. And when she gave him that um, permission and assured him through her words and through her love that she could manage, she would survive, he was able to let go of that really painful body and experience the freedom from that pain. So in Buddhism, we have this other perspective, whether we take this on board or not, but we have this idea that there are many lives, that this is not the end. And sometimes the body's so worn out and tired that it's actually a great relief to let it go. It's like giving up one vehicle, like one old uh, clapped out car for a new, better, more efficient one. And we take our qualities with us. We take all the goodness, all the kindness, the generosity, even the values that we hold, we take them along. And it's not that this is a person continuing, but it's a process. So, you know, if our minds have naturally been inclining towards goodness, most of us are not going to be enlightened, <clears throat> right? You're still going to have things you need to work on again and maybe things you regret or, you know, things you could have done better. But the point is, it's the general inclination of your life. And I think this is another thing that we can uh, do when another person's dying is to give them confidence to point out that, you know, if they've been leading more or less a good life, if their intention has been to be kind, to be generous, to do their best, then they're headed in a good direction for sure. There's a bit of a myth in, um, in Buddhism and in Buddhist circles, which I was also um, uh, kind of, I took on board, that it's the last mind moment that determines your next life. But the reality is that dying is a process. It's not necessarily a moment in time. And nobody really knows what that moment is. And later I came to understand through studying the Buddha's suttas, so these are the ones found in the Pali Canon, that uh, some of the idea about the last mind moment being the determining factor of the next rebirth is actually from the Abhidhamma. It's a commentarial text that came after the Buddha. And in the suttas, it's much more about the general qualities of one's life, which in a way makes sense, right? I mean... If somebody's, you know, committed all kinds of um, harmful actions in their life and then in the last moment they think, may all beings be happy, is that good enough? Probably not, right? It doesn't really make much sense. On the contrary, somebody may be a very virtuous person, you may have been able to meditate even very deeply, but at the end of the life you might lose that capacity simply because the faculties are wearing away. And even in the um, suttas, there's a story of one monk who was quite established in deep meditation. That means deep samadhi states. And towards the end of his life, the Buddha went to see him and he was in a terrible mess. He was really worried. He said, oh, my samadhi has fallen away. My samadhi has fallen away. You know, what on earth is going to become of me? And the Buddha basically said, is that your practice? You know, these, these tranquil states? That is not the measure of deep practice. What do you take to be a self? Are you identified with your body? Do you have the feeling that the body is me, the body is mine? I am within the body or the body is within me. How about feelings? Do you identify with feelings? Are they yours? Are they you? Are you in the feeling? Is the feeling in you? And the same with perception, are they yours? Do you own them? Are you, is this you, this self inside perception? Is perception inside a self? <clears throat> and consciousness, consciousness too, is that you? Is it yours? Can you control it? You know, are, is there a being inside consciousness or is consciousness inside a being? Is there a being at all? So he got him to analyze in this way and 
this person developed a lot of insight to the extent which, and this is a bit funny and <laughs> you might kind of, yeah, think this is not the point. I also thought, is this really the point? But that person got so much insight and liberation from this reflection that he actually recovered from his sickness and delayed his death. <laughs> So this is what you can do if you really don't want to die <laughs> when it comes to that time. But I think deeper than that, it was the letting go and the complete acceptance, you know, a non-identification with the process that allowed the body and the mind in this case to re-energize and actually to heal. But in a way you can say, you know, whatever we do, whatever scientific interventions there are, whatever top surgeons we might have, um, however well off we are, however well we eat and exercise, we are just postponing the inevitable, right? At some point we have to die. And it's important to remind the person who's dying that they have done the best they could. They've lived a wonderful life, yeah? I'm sure that they will have done because each one of you must have very good friends and wonderful family members and or people that you know and it's important to try to remove their fears. First of all, by telling them that it's the general quality of their life that will determine um, how they die. And also, something very important is that sickness, old age, death, is nobody's fault. This is especially important maybe for younger people who perhaps end up with a terminal disease at an age that, you know, would not be expected. Actually, it should be expected, but, you know, we tend to think of dying as something that older people do. Um, but it is not our fault if we get sick. It's not that we've done something wrong or made mistakes. My own teacher, Ajahn Brahm, had a significant experience before he was a monk. And uh, he used to watch this program with these two very fit, sporty people doing yoga postures. And uh, they were kind of the epitome of health. And one day he was watching and the guy just literally fell dead in the middle. I don't know if he was in the middle of a pose, but actually on live air. <laughs> so, you know, he did everything right. He was actually helping others at that time, but still he had to die. So we don't avoid that. And there's a bit of another myth in Buddhism, that uh, everything is caused by karma, yeah? As though karma is some sort of fate. And the mistake there is that sometimes we, there is a passage that says, uh, I think something around if we've killed other beings, the, one of the karmic consequences of that is that we'll have a short life, right? But it's important to understand that karma, the understanding of cause and effect, is always from now to the future. So it's what are we doing now and how will that influence the future? We don't look at somebody who has a short life and say that means they must have done something in the past. That's not the way it works. It's not um, that anything is predetermined. And the Buddha said there are many causes for a short life, karma being only one. There's also the cause of accident or weather or disease, which is not necessarily caused by things we've done in the past. And the point is we simply don't know. Yeah, it's impossible to say. The Buddha said karma <clears throat> is something that's impossible to fathom. It's so incredibly deep. But what we can know is that what we're doing now will have effects for us in the future. And that's where this um, teaching on karma gives us a sense of empowerment and agency. It's not that anything is predestined. But how we live now will have its effects. We don't know when. We don't know exactly how. But we can trust that in this moment, there's time to still do good. There's a lovely sutta um, on loving kindness, where the Buddha says, even if one were to develop thoughts of loving kindness for the time it takes to snap one's fingers or pull a cow's udder, for anyone who has cows and milks them regularly, maybe no one, I guess. <laughs> but it's a very short time. For anyone who develops loving kindness, even to that extent, they are practicing the Buddha's teachings. And that will have powerful effects, stronger and greater effects than giving food to 200 people who need food. And that might sound strange. It might sound like, hmm, does that mean there's no place for kind of uh, social service and action? 
But I think what he's really pointing to is that if we're working on the qualities, the motivations of our mind, we're even more likely to do good for others and to offer food and uh, medicine and maybe assist a person who's dying, etc. Because our mind is full of loving kindness. It's developing that love as a motivation, as a disposition to life. So there's always time to do good. And um, it's important to try and reflect with a person who's dying on the goodness of their life. You know, you can start off by expressing your gratitude if you know the person um, for their particular qualities that you admire. The other week, like three days ago or something, my life goes very, uh, it's very rich at the moment. My parents came to stay with me and uh, they came to stay in our new monastery, which was really special because I guess for most parents, especially from non-Buddhist countries, it's a little bit strange when your daughter or maybe your son goes forth, you know. And in my case, I went to Asia at a young age when I was about 19 and lived there for the best part of the next 16 years and eventually ordained in Myanmar. And I think that was a little bit difficult for them to reconcile, even though they would have never expressed uh, disapproval overtly. But still, I could sense that was a wrench. You know, there were many years that I couldn't really call them up. They just had to wait for the next aerogram for anyone who's old enough. You get these little, like, prepaid aerograms that you fold into three and <laughs> stick them in some thing that looks like a postbox in a little street in India and you hope for the best. <laughs> it can be a month later that the, the post comes through, you know. Um, but luckily for me, I guess, one of the advantages of the last uh, nine years or so trying to establish a monastery over here is that my parents have had more access to my teachers and also to the people around me in the community. And through them, they've come to understand that what I'm doing is actually affecting other people's lives in a positive way. Not always. <laughs> I'm sure I don't affect everybody in a positive way, but certainly, um, you know, being able to share the Dhamma is causing a lot of, um, well, it alleviates suffering, you know, for many people. So they had a really nice time. And uh, towards the end, my mom almost praised me, but she, she said it in a way like, oh, well, you know, you know you're amazing, I don't have to tell you, do I? And I said, oh, really? Yeah, no, it'd be nice if you told me that. <laughs> I don't always think that. Um, she's like, well, I don't need to say it, why should I say it? And I think maybe that's the Western shyness, the Britishness. But actually, it's really important to do that. People don't know. They don't know how they're affecting, how they're affecting your life. They don't know that you see all this goodness in them. You know, there's scientific proof that one word of criticism or perceived criticism, okay, because often <laughs> we read criticism where it's not meant, um, takes probably seven times more positive input <clears throat> to undo. And that's if you're lucky, right? I mean, how many of us just carry around all the unkind words and the, the faults that we supposedly have or the mistakes that we've made and we don't really bother to reflect on the goodness of our lives and the things we've done right, the things we're proud of, pleased about. You don't have to do this in an egotistical way, but the Buddha said, bring it up. So we can help other people to do that and, um, you know, point out maybe that they've had beautiful livelihoods, that they've really brought benefit to the world. Uh, there's a practice in Sri Lanka and I guess it's spreading among Buddhist circles, maybe in this group, um, where people keep a little diary of things that they've done, little acts of kindness, generosity, charity, service, and they just write it down once a day. And in Sri Lanka, they call it a little merit book, and they start from childhood. And the purpose of this is uh, not only to bring it up, you know, in one's daily life and to encourage one to do more and more, good acts that help others, but also to read it out at the time of that person's death. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that when they are in hospital, sick or gravely ill, somebody actually goes through that book and reads out all these things and it uplifts their mind. Mm -hmm. Imagine how beautiful that would be, you know, and this puts them in a really good state of mind, a confident state of mind, to leave this world with no regrets. 
and it can be a celebration. It doesn't have to be a tragedy when we know we've lived that well. Yeah. Again, we can forget about the things that we couldn't have known until we knew them, right? Our understanding is conditioned. Sometimes we don't have enough wisdom to make good decisions. But by reflecting on death, actually, we learn to make better choices for our lives, for ourselves, for our loved ones, and uh, certainly bring more value to our lives, even the simple things in life. It's like things you took for granted seem to open up. I noticed even at lunchtime, because of the theme of the day, just realizing how fast I usually move around, you know, when I have many things to do. It's like this thing, then the next thing. And in a way, it's quite energizing. You can get kind of into it, you know, go to this and then this, and you feel quite alert. But isn't it lovely to slow down? Isn't it just really nice to walk slowly through the grass and just feel the breeze and, you know, look at the trees. It's springtime. It's not the same as last spring. It's not the same as next spring. <laughs> it's happening right now. And the weather's always changing. England's really, really uh, a beautiful place to witness impermanence in nature. It's really shifting all the time. And uh, it can help us feel much more alive, alive to the moment. Apparently, I think in Australia, maybe everywhere, some, uh, some people are starting to um, prepare their own funerals before they've died and their eulogies as well. <laughs> they get other people to write them, hopefully. I don't know if they write their own. Um, so that they actually hear some of the things that they've meant to other people. And also they want to know who comes to the funeral. So, <laughs> so they can uh, shorten their list of friends. But, you know, what if we could do that now? We could kind of rejoice about our lives already and not wait until the end. Wouldn't that be just so much more beautiful? So the last little thing I want to talk about today, and I've kind of waited till the end of this talk, is um, to talk about the dying journey itself. And obviously, well, maybe it's obvious that I can't remember my previous death, um, presuming there've been not one, but many. But uh, again, looking at some of the very strong evidence that's been scientifically studied on this thing called near-death experiences, and I brought along a little book where I read a few inspiring things, and I would definitely encourage people to read this. I found that even through reading it, I got a sense of upliftment and peace, just kind of putting myself in the shoes of these people who were dying and experiencing these near-death um, experiences. It's basically they are clinically dead, like they've been um, announced clinically dead by the doctors. That means there's no heartbeat, there's no brain activity, to all extents and purposes, these people are not conscious, right? Um, and the peace that they experience is something so similar to the peace that's available through meditation. So this little book is called After, so they're not making any religious claim, it's not called Life After Life or After Life, but it's just called After. So what happens after the brain stops working and the senses fade. You know, the senses aren't working. And it's just such a beautiful book that talks about really how death is something not to be feared. And one of the results of these near-death experiences for most people who experience them is that their fear of death um, exponentially decreases. And their ability to embrace life and spirituality and take risks and live more fully, love more fully, increases manifold. So there are subjective experiences, and uh, a couple that touched me were one about a boy who drowned. He was very young and uh, I think sunburned, and, the, and he tried to dive into this pool, but instead he did a massive belly flop. <laughs> I'm sure we've all done those. And uh, because of the burnt skin, for some reason, it sent his body into shock and he found himself drowning. And during the time he was drowning, he realized that on the one part, there was this part of him that was terrified. And then suddenly something kind of separated and the mind expanded to become the one who was watching, the calm one watching the whole process. And he was saying that this other kind of 
sense of himself, this calm one, as he described it, watching, felt much more profound, much more real. And he realized how the body had limited him, him and how much more peace there was right now. So he was almost as a witness to this whole process and obviously came round again and found that his life had changed. Another one that was interesting, and I've picked some which kind of uh, point at some of these key features of these experiences, is where a woman who was a champion diver hit her head on the diving board. And she said it was like time started to kind of become very fast and very slow at the same time until it became kind of timeless. And she said she moved forward into a place where she was loved and where things made absolute sense. Things made profound sense. And they could almost communicate. I think in some of these near-death experiences, there were other beings as well. And they were communicating almost subverbally, not with language, but just through love. Another lady had um, a head-on accident and, had a near, and was clinically dead, right? Pronounced clinically dead. And she said that um, she was kind of being sucked down this dark tunnel, but without any fear at all. Again, just as though she was watching the whole process. Until at the end of that tunnel, she saw a light. This is very familiar, right? Probably to many of us. Um, this idea of seeing a light. And she said that light was immensely intense, but it was also like love. It was like intense love that didn't just go around her, but went through her and all around her completely suffusing her so there was no fear at all and there was a warm comforting and peaceful silence and uh, one of the things I found most interesting about this book and also about these experiences is that a lot of people made the connection between being free from the senses and experiencing peace experiencing um, something much bigger than the senses can allow. And this has actually led to some uh, new scientific explanations for the, um, for the function of the brain. You know, like in the past and maybe in mainstream science now, people think that the mind is a product of the brain, which is kind of tricky to explain, right? That something as profound and subtle and ephemeral as consciousness can actually be produced by a lump of I don't know what a blobby lump of gray stuff <laughs> inside the skull and nowadays scientists are actually starting to think that it's more that the brain is a vehicle through which the mind um, kind of processes information but it the, the brain actually um, filters the information we need just to keep the body alive so it filters much of what's available to know and focuses its energy on the things that pertain to the senses, the things that we need to stay alive. In case that's really difficult to understand, perhaps I'll just read this little passage out. And this is by Aldous Huxley, who is an English philosopher. So he says, the function of the brain and the nervous system is to protect us from being overwhelmed and confused by this mass of largely useless and irrelevant knowledge, by shutting out most of what we, we should otherwise perceive or remember at any moment, and leaving only that very small and special selection, which is likely to be practically useful. Insofar as we are animals, our business is at all costs to survive, to make biological survival possible. Mind at large has to be funneled through the reducing valve of the brain and nervous system. What comes out at the other end is a measly trickle of the kind of consciousness which will help us to stay alive on the surface of this particular planet. <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it? It's as though the mind is like a filter, the brain is like a filter for the mind. So when these people leave, or when the brain kind of dies, and the mind expands beyond that, it sees so much more. And that's the mystery, isn't it? This is, in a sense, what we're trying to understand through meditation. You know, 
what the mind is really capable of and whether there is something beyond this life and death. You know, the Buddha experienced that, we can experience that, and we can get a taste of that as well, the more peace we find inside. So what strikes me really is just how similar this process is to the experience of deep meditation where also people can see lights when the mind becomes very peaceful, the body starts to fade and you know there's also a sense of enormous peace and love. You know sometimes stillness and love are so similar. Yeah, they're sort of aspects of the same thing. It's a feeling of deep safety, a deep sense of connection and belonging something that is far beyond what this limited sense of self, you know, whatever we identify as a self, whether our body, our gender, our race, our perception, our feelings. So often we say, oh, I'm not feeling myself today. You know, what is yourself? Who said you should feel a certain way? You know, isn't all of this just nature playing out according to cause and effect? So what was really remarkable about many of these experiences is the power of them to transform those people's lives. And uh, as I said, it changed their attitude to death and to life. It helped them take more risks, but also to be able to give and receive more love and to have an increased sense of compassion and concern. They were much more likely to help other people. They were much more likely to move away from livelihoods that were harmful into livelihoods that were focused on serving and helping others. And just to end this little uh, discussion, I would really like to read one more story out, which is particularly um, startling for the contrast and the transformation it brought about in this person's life. So all the names are changed in this book, um, and I'll just skim through the first bit, but this is a person who worked for the mafia. Now that's not a very good job according to Buddhist right livelihood. And uh, they were a chief steward of a mob-owned resort uh, where one of the prime functions was to provide sexual and other kinds of illicit entertainment for the celebrities who performed there. And he had a number of high-class prostitutes who he often treated roughly. And this person actually ended up having a near-death experience and came out completely transformed to the extent that um, luckily he was able to leave the mafia, the friends let him go, <laughs> which might not have been the case. But his girlfriend, who was obviously, I don't know, enjoyed the money and the power of hanging around him, was quite upset about this change and she left him. So he lost all of his former life. And uh, I'd like to speak in his words because it's just really interesting to hear what he says. So he says, before the experience, my attitude was that people have to help themselves. You know, if they don't help themselves, to hell with them. I had a pretty cynical attitude towards people. I couldn't imagine myself as any sort of helping professional before the near-death experience. But afterwards, I find myself counseling people. I find myself listening to people. They say, you really listen to me. You really understand how I feel inside. Before, I'd say, listen, pal, I ain't got the time. God helps those who help themselves, so get your butt out there and help yourself, because it's war out there on the street. Make sure you cover yourself, because it's a war. But after my near-death experience, my whole outlook changed. I can feel it when people are in pain. Before, sometimes I had to cause people pain but I couldn't do that anymore after my heart attack. Before, I had to take care of number one. If I gave myself to a job, gambling or whatever, I'd carry it out. The experience made me more sensitive to and aware of others' pain. I still get very teary about others who are in pain. People I know can't understand that. Sometimes I sit down and look around at myself and I say, what the hell am I doing here? I could be making 10 times this money, but I don't want that. My needs are simple. I'm very content. I could live in one room. I used to have a big Cadillac, a luxury apartment. I needed those things. They were necessary for my identity. But now, to tell the truth, it doesn't make any difference whether I make $10 a day 
or $10,000 a day. It doesn't matter, that's not what's important in our trip here on Earth. <laughs> if only we could all have near-death experiences <laughs> before we die. But at the time of our dying, how do we want to go? <clears throat> what do we want to be remembered for? You know, How do we want to look back on our lives? What are the things that will really matter at that time? You know, will we be kind of feeling, oh, I wish I'd made more money. I wish I'd had a car like my friend. <laughs> you know, even all your degrees or, or whatever, will it really make that much difference? Unless you really help someone else, you know. So I think it's important to um, reflect on death in whatever way feels resonant for us, but to increase our kind of emotional resilience towards pain, towards fear, towards grief, and to be able to open up to the reality of human fragility, yeah, of the vulnerability of being a human being or being any being who breathes, you know, not really knowing what's ahead and having that open and curious heart. And if we can do this, and if we can really take care of the present moment and try to have a really beautiful attitude to life, we can actually look forward to our time of dying with confidence and joy in our hearts. We can feel that this is just the summation of a life well lived, a cause for celebration rather than grief, and a cause for confidence that all those qualities you've developed in your life will continue. You know, they'll continue to have their fruits in the world with those people you've left behind. One of the things that helps me when I consider losing my parents, losing my teacher, who are all in their only 70s, but, you know, my parents don't like being referred to as elderly, but 70s, you know, you're getting closer. You know, maybe we live to 100. Who knows? It's more and more likely the older we get. Um, but one of the things I often uh, reflect on to console me is that whatever I've learned from those people, I can continue to grow in myself. You know, like the Buddha said to his disciple, are they going to take away our virtue, our peace, our wisdom? Yeah, maybe the mind gets shaken temporarily. That's quite normal. And there's nothing to be ashamed of or afraid of. It's not a sign that you're not spiritually mature the sign of spiritual maturity is that capacity to hold grief and gratitude side by side yeah? and to open up our hearts with compassion to both. So reflecting on death and understanding impermanence, and that's something we can experience at any given time, you know, just by simply closing your eyes, you can feel the more your mindfulness develops, you can feel the feelings change. It's not that now they're there, now they're gone. It's like there's a constant morphing of experience. There's a constant um, fading away. And when we realize this, it loosens clinging. Because how can we cling to that which is disappearing, like sand through our fingers each moment of our lives? And meditation, lastly, is an opportunity to learn to let go a little bit of our attachment to all that we take to be mine, to be me, myself, under my control, and to realize that this is just nature, you know, cause and effect, empty processes rolling on, <laughs> just empty processes. But that, that is no reason to turn away. That is a reason to care more, right? That is a reason to really... Um, cherish the moment, cherish the people around us. Lastly, a little simile from Ajahn Chah comes to mind. He um, said to his disciples at the time, he held up this glass. He said, see this glass? What happens if I throw it on the floor? They say, well, obviously the glass will break if you throw it on the floor. And he says, yes, it's fragile. And because it's fragile, therefore we should care. So this is really what counts in the end. It's how well we've loved, and that means how well we've loved ourselves as well as others around us. And we can develop that love, we can develop that generosity, that goodness in our hearts in any given moment of our life. <laughs>
simply by the way we relate to the moment. And that will manifest as helpful thoughts and actions to those around us and build up much more compassionate and caring, hopefully equitable societies where people who are dying can also receive the care that they need. You know, we can look out for the vulnerable people among us and, uh, and not have to turn the other way. So, that is a little bit longer a talk than I expected to give, and the time is very precious and short. So, um, I would like to invite us to do a little bit more meditation. I think I'm inclined to probably do half an hour and then just have a shorter break for a little bit of a um, respite, some walking, a cup of tea. Um, because I do think it'd be nice to have some discussion among us. What do you think? Yeah? Okay. And uh, for this meditation, I am thinking about doing a little kind of imagination or visualization of our time of death. Does that sound scary? <laughs> No? Yes? No? And it will be nice. It will be like floating out of our bodies and uh, being surrounded by peace. So for that meditation, it is actually quite nice if you can lie down. You don't have to. You really don't have to because I realize there might not be enough room for everyone. But if you want to, you're welcome. And if you snore, it's okay. <laughs> If you uh, are comfortable on the floor, that's absolutely fine. And if you feel you'd be more comfortable in a chair, that's also recommended. I have an extra cushion if anyone wants one. Anyone want a cushion for their head? I'm a bit jealous now because I can't teach lying down. <laughs> okay. So once you've made your body comfortable, just allow your awareness, your kindfulness to spread as though you're basking in the beautiful, gentle rays of the sun. And that sun is soaking you through from the top of your head to the tips of the toes. All you have to do is soak it up and feel that sunshine relaxing and soothing your body and mind. Noticing if any of your limbs are pressing too hard against the floor or the chair and just adjusting to give your body the maximum ease and comfort. So you can more easily let it go. Allowing your body to relax. Allowing any sensations you experience, any feelings in the body, whether pleasant or painful, or in between, to gently bring your mind into the present moment. All 
all your energy now inside. As if you're alone in your own little private place. Happy and at ease. With nothing to do but be still. And I'd like you to begin by just connecting to some quality in your heart that you really admire. Something that's a strength. Something you really respect about yourself. Such as your integrity, honesty, kindness, generosity, perhaps you're quite patient, maybe you're a good listener, or someone who simply tries to do your best. just see if you can connect to how it feels to behave in that way, to be kind, to be generous, to be patient. Connecting to that noble quality of heart and feeling good about your life. And now I'd like you to imagine, if you wish, if this is comfortable for you, that you're lying in a hospital or a place of your choice in a very clean and simple room, a place where you feel at ease. A place where you can deeply relax, knowing that you're coming to the end of your life. There's nothing more you need to concern yourself with. There's nothing much to look at, so your eyes are closed. But perhaps you need to just say goodbye in your heart to those you love and express your gratitude to them for being a good friend or parent, partner, pet,
just bringing a few of those people to mind and thanking them from the depth of your heart for everything they've given you, everything you've learned. And just noticing their response. Perhaps words of appreciation to you. Perhaps there's some hesitation, some sadness on either part. Just holding space for that too. Looking them in the eyes and assuring them you're going to be fine. And seeing them gently soften, relax, and give you their blessings for your journey on. Taking your time, enjoying this moment of connection from heart to heart. And sensing that something of those people you love will be coming along, accompanying you. Sensing how they've enriched your life. given you the strength to journey on. And as you continue to relax and let go, you realize your gradually letting go of your body the way you knew it before. All you need to do, all you can do now is to lie down in this bed and allow the body to go its own way. There's no need to keep up appearances, no need to perform. Your position in the world, your titles, your accolades, all of that has to go.
You may have memories of sights, sounds, smells, tastes and touch. All that now feels like a dream. as you move deeper inside your body and mind. To notice the qualities inside. The qualities you've cultivated in your life. A sense of ease, acceptance, kindness, courage. And a feeling of great gratitude comes over you to realize you've made good use of your life. Perhaps you remember a time that you really helped someone. A time that you said something kind. Sacrifice something for somebody else. or treated yourself like a friend with respect, with compassion. And as you move deeper into these qualities in your mind, You notice there's a sense of peace, confidence. That death is not something to be feared. You allow the body to fade away into the background of your mind. Until the time that you really don't know whether you're still alive or you've started to make that transition from the world of the senses to the world of the mind, of consciousness that's becoming more and more bright, more and more peaceful. As though you're surrounded by love And you realize there's nothing you need to do anymore. You're completely held, completely bathed in love. A love more powerful, more profound, more unconditional than anything you've experienced before.
Perhaps you're still aware of your breath, but your breath is becoming smooth and soft, like a gentle pillow upon which you can rest your head and just be carried allowing the mind to expand beyond its usual sense of limitation its preoccupation with a sense of self So freeing. You realize there's nothing to fear. And from this perspective, an overwhelming feeling of gratitude comes over you to all those people in your life. And you realize they're all going to be fine. You send them your loving kindness, your gratitude, your goodwill. as you realize this is the destiny of us all. To be free, to be light, to be filled with love. To be open to the journey ahead.
And as we come towards the end of this meditation, there's still time to review from this perspective. From the perspective of dying, is there anything you feel you've left undone, unsaid? Just reviewing objectively. <coughs> From this perspective of peace, of letting go, of dying, are there any changes you'd like to make to your life? Any ways you could be with less control, less worry, Any ways you'd rather be spending your time? And slowly, gently, coming back to your breath, back to the world of sounds, noticing the traffic in the distance, the sounds around you in the hall, the touch of your body, your ankles, your buttocks, your head on the floor. And notice that feeling in your heart. How was it to let go that little bit more Gently starting to wiggle your toes, your fingertips, maybe stretch out your arms, your spine. And recognize that you're here, alive in this moment. At least I hope you all are. And there's still time to cultivate those qualities you really wish to develop in your heart.
So we now have a 10 to 15 minute optional break for you to get some fresh air or a cup of tea or just stand on the grass or lie down a little longer as you wish. And after that I thought we could gather here about half past two and uh, perhaps if it's possible we could be in a circle that be possible so we can just shift our seats and cushions a little bit if you want to still sit on these mats it's okay we can have kind of like two circles i guess kind of we'll just see how we can do it we can see one another and uh see what wants to be shared so i'll see you soon <laughs>